Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone had a nice, long Labor Day weekend. Uh, welcome to the second installment of our Workforce Wednesday briefing mini-series set for the month of September. I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Uh, thanks for joining us today for a new spin on Conservation Corps. Last week, we kicked off September with preparing high schoolers for green careers. If you missed that briefing, or we'd like to learn more about the wide range of climate, clean energy, and environmental topics we cover, please take a moment to visit us online at www.esi.org. And the best way to stay up to date on briefings, including the rest of our works, uh, Workforce Wednesday mini-series, please sign up for our bi-weekly Climate Change Solutions newsletter. We have a jam-packed four-person panel today, so I will keep my introduction very short. The idea of a conservation corps has been around for a while. Uh, probably the most familiar example is the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was active in the 1930s and 40s and served uh, those unemployed in the wake of the Great Depression. And since then, youth conservation corps have continued that legacy. The new spin referenced in our title of our briefing today is what it's all about. Our four panelists are taking the Conservation Corps model to new heights and new places and with new urgency to improve our environment and mitigate climate change. And more recently, with millions hit by historic unemployment caused by the coronavirus outbreak and facing an uncertain future, these programs are ever more valuable to those in need of work. For the people involved, the core itself, these organizations provide exciting, engaging, on-the-ground experience to equip them no matter where their careers and sustainability take them. It's a great topic for today, and there's still much more to learn over the course of the next three weeks. Energy transitions in coal country, growing green industry and innovation, mass timber, and low carbon small business and post COVID recovery. And be on the lookout for a bonus briefing about the just transition taking place in coal communities. One last bit of logistics. After our final panelist, we will open up the floor for questions. But because we're online, I cannot call on you if you have a question. So if you have a question, the best way to ask it is by following EESI on Twitter at EESI online, or you can also send in an email uh, and email in your questions that way. The email address you should use is eesi at eesi.org. And with that dispensed with, now we'll move on to our panelists who are really exciting today. Our first panelist is Chad, uh, excuse me, Chaz Robles. Uh, Chaz began with the Southwest Conservation Corps in April 2012 as a field supervisor and co-led a disaster relief crew in New York in November 2012. Uh, 2020, I can't talk today, I'm sorry. It's the Labor Day weekend. Uh, and led a disaster relief crew in New York in November 2012 after Hurricane Sandy. In January 2013, he began as Ancestral Lands Program Coordinator, working with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and Acoma Pueblo to support existing programs and bring, bring new conservation opportunities to tribal lands in the Southwest. Chaz became Ancestral Lands Program Director in 2015 and Corps Director in 2019. Chas, welcome to the briefing today. I'm really looking forward to your remarks. Good morning. I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico, so it's still morning out here, but uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the intro, Dan. My name is Chas Robles. Mexica, Chichimeca, Zacateco. My ancestors come from Central Mexico region, um, and I have the privilege of being the core director of the Ancestral Lands Conservation Corps, which is a program of conservation legacy. Uh, brief history on conservation legacy. Uh, we were created in uh, 1998 as Southwest Youth Corps, uh, and over the years have uh, expanded. Uh, and that was Southwest Youth Corps, Youth Corps was started in Durango, Colorado. And over the years, we've uh, expanded our programming um, into the Southwest, have offices opened in Salida, uh, Colorado, um, Tucson, Arizona, Flagstaff, Arizona, and our program in Ancestral Lands, and quickly uh, continue to, to partner with new and burgeoning conservation corps across the country. So it no longer made a lot of sense for us to be called Southwest Youth Corps or Southwest Conservation Corps. Uh, and in 2014, we um, be became Conservation Legacy. Conservation Legacy runs uh, crew-based and individual placement programs across the country with programs such as the Southeast Conservation Corps based out of Chattanooga, Tennessee, the Appalachian Conservation Corps, um, uh, Southwest Conservation Corps, and uh, Arizona Conservation Corps, 
and the stewards program. Um, so we do a lot of different, uh, have a lot of different programming across the country. Uh, my program, the Ancestral Lands Program, we were created in 2008. So for a number of years, we saw uh, a lot of conservation corps reaching out to native communities, tribes and pueblos to, to recruit uh, Native American youth and young adults into their programs. Um, and there were a lot of successes, but we also saw a number of barriers to participation and barriers to successful completion of our, of our young folks within these programs. And so in uh, 2008, um, uh, a gentleman named Cornell Terivio, who was a crew leader with the Southwest Conservation Corps program out of Durango, and saw just all the great impacts that Conservation Corps programs were having on young folks from across the country, worked with our former uh, president and CEO, Harry Brule, uh, to instead of bring Native young folks into the Conservation Corps, to bring the Conservation Corps movement to our, our Native communities and our Native young folks where they were. And, and thus the Ancestral Lands Program was created. We started in the Pueblo of Acoma, which is a Pueblo about 45 minutes west of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, over the years, we've had a number of other uh, Pueblos and tribes and, and Native communities uh, approach us and ask us to replicate the programs in their communities. So since our, our creation in 2008, uh, we've seen uh, a, a, an office develop in Gallup, New Mexico, serving the Navajo Nation, the Ne young folks. Uh, that was in 2013 uh, when I started as a program coordinator is when we opened the, uh, that office. Uh, 2014 saw us um, partner with the Pueblo of Zuni uh, in Western New Mexico to open up an office serving Zuni young folks. Uh, in 2015, uh, we opened our program here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, focusing on serving urban Native young folks and, and also partnering with some of the surrounding pueblos here in Al Albuquerque. Uh, and then 2017, we opened up our office in uh, the Hopi Nation. So we currently have those five offices. Uh, we run fairly conventional Conservation Corps programming in that we our bread and butter is putting crews of young folks, between five and 10 young folks, uh, in a field-based program. So they stay in the field for up to 10 or 12 days at a time, completing various conservation and stewardship uh, projects. So a lot of trail construction, habitat restoration, um, invasive species removal, and we have a pretty large historic preservation program, uh, primarily focusing on ancestral Puebloan sites. So uh, it's a really great opportunity where we get to send the descendants of the folks who built uh, those structures back in the 1100s and 1200s sites such as Chaco Canyon, Mesa Verde. I think I was talking about our uh, historic preservation programs when the energy cut out. Um, so I'll pick it up from there and just give a little bit more information about the work that we're doing. I was mentioning, uh, we work with national parks such as uh, Chaco Canyon, Mesa Verde National Park, uh, Aztec Ruins, uh, El Moro and El Mal Pais National Monuments, um, as well as um, nonprofit organizations like the Friends of Cedar Mesa to do work out in Utah on uh, anc ancestral Puebloan dwellings. Um, so it is, it's a really cool opportunity to bring the descendants of the folks who built those structures uh, centuries ago to come in and work to protect them for current and future generations to appreciate and enjoy, uh, as well as, you know, for the cultural uh, significance that they have to, uh, to our people and to those, those folks who uh, can, can trace their lineage to uh, the ancestral Puebloans who built those structures. Um, we also do, uh, so we strive to incorporate cultural components into our programming whenever possible. And some of the ways that we do that are through our traditional farm core programs. Uh, we've been running a farm core in the Pueblo of Acoma for a number of years now. Um, and also we have worked in Zuni uh, as well as Hopi uh, to run some farming programs and really working to reconnect young folks with that. Uh, with that heritage, with that culture of, uh, of 
agriculture of the of farming so not just uh, farming traditional crops heirloom variety crops uh, but also reconnecting young folks to the cultural significance the ceremonies and the prayers and everything else that goes into uh, to providing food for for our communities that food often is given to the communities for free of charge community members um, so that food goes back into uh, to the community supporting tribal food sovereignty and uh, reconnecting our young folks with with those ways we also run hiking club programs um, where young folks go out and learn how to recreate uh, responsibly uh, on the lands they learn about the significance of of the public lands that they're working on and that those lands hold significance not just because they are public lands that are open to them to go and enjoy with their families but also because their ancestors and their people have a long history of uh, living with and communing with and stewarding those lands um, and that you know those lands are theirs uh, not just because they're public lands but because they have those deep ties and connections to those lands um, and we really it's a good opportunity to bring in elders from our communities and have those gen intergenerational learning opportunities the elders can come and share their wisdom and their knowledge with the young folks about these places they can learn the young folks can learn about the significance of these places the names of these places and the stories um, that are attributed to these these places while learning about how to go out and and recreate safely and responsibly and, and making that connection with the land that will serve them uh, for years to come um, one of our other main focuses is preparing our young folks for success in, in their professional lives too so we have a number of innovative programs um, that not only introduce young folks to the field of conservation and natural resource protection but also uh, prepare them through trainings and certification earning certifications um, to to be successful uh, in their future endeavors so one of the programs that we're piloting this year is our high school equivalency diploma program uh, and that is where young folks spend um, It'll be an 18 week program this year, earning their, their high school equivalency diploma. So four days a week, uh, they go and work on conservation projects here uh, in the city of Albuquerque, Bernalillo County. Uh, we're partnering with the city, with the county. Uh, there are open space divisions. We're partnering with nearby um, national parks, uh, Petroglyph National Monument, uh, by the Oro National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, they're going out and, and completing these important projects. And then on Fridays, they come here and we, with our partner organization, La Placita Institute here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, they work towards earning their, their GED, their high school equivalency diploma. Uh, they get mentor, direct mentorship to complete those classes to earn that, um, that diploma. Uh, and then we're also doing other professional development like financial literacy classes, uh, resume building workshops, uh, USA Jobs um, workshop so that folks can learn how to build their resume and apply for uh, jobs with federal agencies like the National Park Service and the Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, etc. Um, another program that we were planning on running this year, but COVID threw a wrench in those plans, is our high school, or excuse me, our uh, eco ecology restoration certificate program, partnering with Coconino Community College. Eco Culture, another great nonprofit, the National Forest Foundation, the U.S. Forest Service. Um, it'll be a six-month program. Uh, folks will come through that. It'll be field-based, where they're spending their weeks out completing ecological restoration projects, like removing invasive species, planting native species uh, and habitat, planning an ecological restoration project, applying herbicide. They'll get different certifications like um, uh, a chainsaw certification backed by the U.S. Forest Service that's taught by our staff, uh, herbicide applicators licenses in the applicable states, Arizona and New Mexico, all industry recognized certifications that will help them uh, find employment um, and make a career out of natural resource protection, conservation and stewardship. Um, and uh, they'll also earn uh, nine college credits um, while they're out uh, getting paid to participate in this program 
um, as well as that uh, ecological restoration certificate that's uh, industry recognized um, and that'll uh, hopefully propel them into a career in this field. Um, and so that's been a big, a big focus of ours is to really prepare folks for those post-secondary education opportunities and for those career and job opportunities, uh, making that connection uh, for folks that come out of our program. You know, our goal is to have folks who, who are ending our program, leaving our program, already have their next job lined up or already be enrolled in a post-secondary accredited uh, program, whether it's college, university, trades, um, or going into, uh, into uh, a related field. So that's, we're really working to step up our program. We, we're planning with uh, Coconino Community College and EcoCulture to run that program uh, next year with at least one uh, five-person crew for six months, hopefully being able to expand that to more young folks and get them that, that certification and that college credit. Um, and there are a number of federal and state policies and programs that, that support our work. Um, the Public Land Coalition, um, you know, uh, that has been something that's been very supportive of us uh, through the years. We are a member of that coalition. Um, we get some of the benefits uh, uh, to, our, to our participants of being a member of that coalition. One of the big things that we're looking at now that can really help us in the impacts that we've seen from COVID-19 um, in our, in our um, budgets and the loss in revenue and everything else is having the cost share waiver that has been uh, initiated in the fiscal year 21 interior appropriations bill, uh, having that move forward that uh, typically we, we provide a 25% cost share uh, that we're bringing those funds to the table through our, our structure, uh, typically through in-kind, sometimes through cash. Um, and that's part of the requirement. And that's something that we really appreciate is that we're invested in that, but in these hard financial times, um, having that wave would be a huge benefit to to our program and to other Conservation Corps programs um, from what we've heard across the country. Obviously, the Great American Outdoor Act is, uh, is something that we're really looking forward to uh, partnering with our agency uh, partners um, to continue to, to complete really critical infrastructure projects for uh, for our parks, uh, for our forests and grasslands um, with the BLM as well. Um, the Indian Youth Service Corps uh, is another really exciting opportunity for us. Um, part of the 21st Conservation Service Corps uh, Act that was passed, really focusing on providing opportunities that we've been providing. We feel like we're working with some other corps across the country and, and being at the, the forefront of this uh, core movement serving native communities, native young folks, and seeing that opportunity be expanded um, to, to other communities through the, the Indian Youth Service Corps. So we really appreciate the support um, and all the work that uh, George McDonald and the Youth Programs Division have been doing uh, with the National Park Service and looking forward to uh, supporting that work moving forward and seeing these opportunities brought to, to more native young folk uh, across the country and more native communities across so that's it. Uh, appreciate everybody's time. If you have any questions or follow up or want to get in touch with me, um, my email address is chas, C H A S, at conservationlegacy.org. Our website is www.ancestrallands.org. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook looking for the Ancestral Lands program. I uh, appreciate your time and appreciate your support. Tiawi. Tasukamati. Our second panelist, uh, we'll start with him, uh, or we'll pick up with him, I should say. Michael French is the Director of Operations of Green Forests Work, a nonprofit that is committed to restoring native forest habitat on lands that were impacted by coal surface mining. Through this program, GFW is improving the economy and environment in the Appalachian region by providing employment and future economic opportunities by implementing ecological restoration projects. Michael also serves as co-chair for the science team of the Appalachian Regional Rest Reforestation Initiative. Michael received his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Kentucky, where he focused his studies on American chestnut restoration and surface mine reforestation. Michael, welcome. Uh, thanks for being flexible with, uh, with our program today, but I'm looking, really looking forward to what you'll have to say and um, 
uh, and take, I'll, I'll leave it over. I'll, I'll leave it to you to take away. Okay. Well, thank you. I'll go ahead and share my screen and, um, okay. So I'm the director of Green Forests Work. We're a nonprofit organization that um, we identified a problem with reforestation across the Appalachian region. Um, so we started this nonprofit and our mission is to restore healthy, productive native forests on lands that have been disturbed by surface mining um, across the Appalachian region. Um, and in doing so, we're not only improving the environment of the Appalachian region, but we're also creating economic opportunities and employment opportunities in doing so. So before the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act was passed, um, reforestation was a common practice on surface mines. And in a lot of cases, the trees were doing very well, as you can see from these black walnuts in Southern Indiana, or from these white oak in Southern Illinois, or these loblolly pine plantations in Western Kentucky. Um, a lot of times the mining companies would come in, they'd extract the coal, they'd leave piles of loose overburden there and trees would naturally regenerate or they would plant trees. And they've been harvesting saw logs and veneer quality timber off of a lot of these older surface mines um, for decades now. So in surface mining, reforestation was commonplace, but there were a lot of other problems associated with surface mining. This is a picture of Letcher County, Kentucky from the 1960s, and this is a practice called shoot and shove mining, where the mining companies would drill down to the coal seam, they'd blast off the rock overburden, and they'd just push it over the hillside. And it created these unstable landforms. Um, sometimes trees would grow up in them, but those landslides would come down the hills, fill up streams, boulders would come through people's houses, damage roads. Um, and there are some fatalities associated with this as well. Uh, there weren't really standardized reclamation practices across the board, so there was widespread erosion and sedimentation of streams and large water quality problems. Sometimes hazardous landforms were just left in place, like this dangerous high wall that you can see on the right. And sometimes the mining companies would leave toxic or acid producing material on the surface. This is a site in Pennsylvania that was mined in the early 1900s. Um, and the pH of the soil there is about 2.6. So the federal government stepped in and passed the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act of 1977, which standardized reclamation practices across the board. It provided oversight to state agencies and their focus was eliminating the problems with human health and safety, eliminating the landslides, boulders coming through people's houses and uh, protecting water quality. So in passing this law, they said that mining companies had to restore the land to an approximate original contour, which means they had to put the mountains back in the shape that they were in before they were mined. You couldn't leave the cliffs in place. Mining companies had to declare a post-mining land use to say what the land would become after the mining was completed. Would it become forest land? Would it become residential commercial? Would it be hay pasture land or something else? And it required that mining companies put up a monetary bond before mining commenced so that if they didn't reclaim the land as they stated that they would, the government would have a pool of money to go back to and restore the land. And it was good. They did a lot of good things with this. You know, they addressed the human health and safety issues, water quality improved, but reforestation really took a back seat, especially in the Appalachian region. This is a photograph of where the law was implemented. You can see in the background, trees were doing well before the law was implemented, but in the foreground, there just aren't many trees. So what happened in post macro reforestation? Um, in an effort to achieve landform stability, eliminate the landslides, mining companies began compacting the surface material. They would put it back up against the dangerous cliffs, they'd track it in with bulldozers, um, and it created a really compacted surface, basically like a, a gravel parking lot. Um, those compacted soils would inhibit root penetration, gas exchange, and water infiltration, and um, that led to a lot of seedling mortality. You know, tree planting failures became really commonplace. So if the mining company had declared the post-mining land use to be forest land afterwards, they would plant the trees, the trees would all die, they'd have to plant them again, the trees would die again, they'd have to plant them again. It became very expensive, and sometimes they couldn't even get their bond money back. 
So they went away from forestry as a post mining land use and started doing widespread implementation of hay pasture land as a post mining land use or wildlife habitat and they became very successful and skilled in this. Um, you can see this here. This was one of the first um, post smacra forest land permits where they were supposed to stop doing the compaction, but they didn't understand anything else. And you can see how many times a bulldozer has run up and down over this hillside. And if you try and plant a tree in there, it's really difficult. You end up just hurting your hands a lot of times. You can see how these bulldozers are packing the hillsides in there on this contour mine. So like I said, tree planting failures became really commonplace. Um, this is a combination of both poor surface material, the growth medium is not very good, but also that's highly compacted and those trees are really suffering. This is a seven year old red oak that was planted in a post smacra um, conventional reclamation condition. They compacted the surface really tight and then they hydro seeded aggressive grasses and legumes. Um, which were used to prevent erosion and green the area up, get vegetation back on the sites. But I want you to remember this seven-year-old red oak here. So where we once had forests across the Appalachian region, hay and pasture land became a post-mining land use of, of choice for the mining companies. It was easy for them to get their bond money back and then they could move on and mine a different area. So about 750,000 to a million acres across Appalachia were converted from forest to other land uses from the 1980s through the mid to early 2000s. So this is a, a map of the coal fields region um, across Appalachia. And there are about 1.7 million acres that have been bond released and another 700,000 acres that have been currently permitted for surface mining. And a lot of the areas after SMACRA was introduced when they would convert them to these hay pasture lands, people weren't using them as hay and pasture land. They weren't grazing cattle on them. They weren't cutting hay off of it. So invasive species moved into these areas. A friend of mine calls this an arboretum of what not to plant. Um, there's a lot of autumn olive in there. There's multiflora rose, bush honeysuckle, just a lot of invasive exotic species on these areas. So it becomes even more problematic when these lands are left unmanaged. So the federal government recognized that they had a problem and they created the Appalachian Regional Reforestation Initiative, whose mission was to get mining companies to plant more high value native hardwoods, increase the survival and growth rates of those trees and speed up the establishment of native forest habitat on surface mines. They did this by listening to the university researchers who had been studying mined land reforestation for decades and knew what the problem was. So they came up with the forestry reclamation approach which said to leave four feet of the best available growth medium on the surface, avoid compacting it, lightly seed tree compatible ground covers, native species um, when possible, and plant a variety of trees, early successional trees and high value hardwood trees, which would later become your crop trees, like your oaks, yellow poplar, black cherry, things of that nature, and then use proper tree planting techniques. And as the researchers already knew, it worked. Um, this is a 17 year old forestry reclamation approach planting in Kentucky, where they're looking at the white pines and yellow poplar that are doing extremely well. And this is a seven year old FRA planting in West Virginia. I want you to take a look at the oak on the left and take a look at the poplars on the right and think about that seven year old oak tree and the compacted spoil and the aggressive ground covers from before and just look at the difference that you can get here. This is a site that we did in 2009 before planting where we plugged the drain in a hollow fill and restored the surface flow to flow across. Uh, it was a stream reconstruction and we use the forestry reclamation approach on the side slopes. This is it in 2009. Here's the same site in 2017. Here's the site in 2019. So you can see the difference there. So we started doing this with the active mining industry, but a lot of these areas that had been bond released, there was no obligation on the part of the mining company, the federal government, state government, the landowner, or any other entity to perform further reforestation measures. This is a 30 year old site that was reclaimed to hay pasture land. And you can see the forest is very slow to regenerate. There are only a couple of species growing in there, mostly black locust, 
Um, it's low biodiversity. And a lot of these areas would take decades, if not centuries, to recover a native forest type. And there's about a 750,000 to a million acres of this out there. So we created this nonprofit as an offshoot of ARI um, to reestablish healthy and productive forests on formerly mined lands across Appalachia. We implement a modified forestry reclamation approach because we can't select the growth medium. It's already been placed there on the surface. And we work on those lands where there's no obligation on the part of any other entity um, to do further reforestation. We work with private landowners, public land managers, and we go in and do large scale ecological restoration projects. So this nonprofit started as a petition to the White House, basically a civilian conservation uh, core style, the jobs program to create jobs across the Appalachian region um, and do these ecological restoration projects. It wasn't funded. Um, we continued on anyway. The Appalachian Regional Commission took notice of what we were doing and gave us startup funding to formalize the 501c3. So now we rely on grants, donations, and partnerships to implement these projects. Our modified FRA says um, control unwanted vegetation through mechanical or chemical means, mitigate compacted ground, plant a variety of trees, and use proper tree planting techniques. And to do this, we hire professional contractors to come out and do it. We work with volunteer groups from K through 12 schools, um, colleges and universities, environmental groups and others uh, to do these projects. But here we've hired a couple of uh, contractors to come out, clear away all of the invasive species that are there, all of that unwanted vegetation, get it back down to a blank slate. But you can still see that we've got that compacted uh, growth medium to deal with. So after we've cleared out the unwanted exotic invasive vegetation, we uh, use a contractor to bring in a large bulldozer to mitigate that compaction. They uh, put these ripping shanks into the ground. They rip it um, generally in two different directions to four feet deep. It's basically like tilling your garden except on a forest scale. It allows water to infiltrate the soil. Um, it slows runoff, prevents runoff and it allows tree roots to extend in all directions. It also speeds up the natural succession process by allowing um, native seeds to rain down on the area, pre preserving native genotypes as well. And then, like I said, we hire professional contractors or get volunteer groups out here to plant a variety of trees. And we're focused on improving two aspects of Appalachia. The environmental infrastructure, we're restoring the ecosystem processes that native forests provide to society from clean air, clean water, wildlife habitat, things of that nature, as well as creating economic and uh, employment opportunities for the people of Appalachia. We're creating jobs for seed collectors, nurseries who are growing the trees, um, bulldozer operators, equipment operators, and we're restoring the forest-based economy. Before Appalachia was a coal mining-based economy, it was a forest-based economy, so we're trying to restore that to the region. Um, in restoring these ecosystem services, we're looking at habitat restoration, improving the hydrology and water quality of the area. By ripping the ground and loosening it up, it increases storage on these areas. And as the forest grows, the trees are gonna uptake and utilize more water um, so it affects the entire water budget of these areas and can buffer watersheds from storm events, helping to mitigate flash flooding. And we're improving air quality as well by increasing particulate interception. And of course, climate change mitigation is a big part of this. By, improving, or by increasing the productivity of the land, um, we're increasing carbon accumulation rates on these areas as well, not only in the above ground biomass, but also in the soil microbial community and the, uh, the litter as well. Um, we often say that surface mines sometimes make the, great, the best places for sequestering carbon. Um, because the soils were blasted off and buried during the mining process, we're dealing with mineral soils that are initially deficient in organic carbon so they can uh, serve as carbon sinks for decades. In doing these projects, we're also reducing forest fragmentation and the threats that they pose by uh, creating edge habitat in um, forest landscapes. This is the Daniel Boone National Forest where there is a 29 acre hole in the forest which allows nest parasites to come in as well as invasive species. It's a reservoir for invasive species. 
So by restoring the native forest habitat in there, we're eliminating that threat to the flora and fauna of the area. And like I said, we're improving the hydrology of these areas. You can see how this has been fluffed up after ripping, and you can also see to the left one of the wetlands that we've created there. It's increasing the storage so that as the water comes in, as rain events come in, um, it soaks up that water. It acts like a sponge and then slowly releases it from the system so it's not just a flash runoff event that was previously there from that compacted surface mine. This is a site on the Monongahela National Forest in West Virginia where we've created about 1,300 wetlands so far. They're different sizes um, and they vary with the seasons as well. And so they're different depths, different sizes to provide habitat for a diversity of wildlife and also a diversity of conditions for uh, the vegetation of the area. By loosening the soil, we're creating these microsites for reptiles, amphibians, small mammals, insects. It's no longer like a golf course. Um, we've, you know, roughed it up so that there's uh, a lot of different uh, habitats as well by pulling up these boulders. It's creating shelter and homes for different insects and uh, different flora. And there are a lot of pollinator benefits to this work as well. When we um, remove that unwanted invasive exotic vegetation, a lot of times we see a flush in the native species that come back and it benefits not only the native pollinators, but also honeybees. From 2009 through 2020, we've had about 390 different projects or volunteer planting events across 10 different states. We've involved more than 17,000 volunteers and hundreds of partners from NGOs, colleges, um, government agencies. We've reforested about 5,000 acres of the Appalachian region through the planting of about 3.1 million trees. And in doing so, like I said, we're creating jobs for seed collectors, equipment operators, nursery workers, tree planters, and secondary industries benefit as well by bringing people and work, a workforce into the region, the hospitality, retail, transportation, and service industries also benefit as they're spending money throughout the region. And this work creates future economic opportunities for forest management, um, the production of timber and non-timber forest products, eco-asset credits, and tourism and recreation as well, things like hunting leases, and just the beautification of the area, which will draw in tourists. So here we've got one of our nurseries lifting some of the trees that we would be planting. Those are a bunch of oaks. Um, here are a couple of pictures of our equipment operators in action, ripping up the land and also creating wetlands for us. Here's some of our professional tree planting crews. Um, every year they're planting hundreds of thousands of trees for us. We've worked with Conservation Legacy, which Chaz was talking about before uh, the internet failed for them. Um, this is the Appalachian Conservation Corps crew. We've contracted them to come in and plant some wetlands on the Monongahela National Forest. They've also spread hundreds of uh, pounds of native grasses and wildflower seeds across the restoration areas that we've done there. And we're working with those crews. We'll be working with them on the Daniel Boone National Forest pretty soon to do invasive species control and they've done trail building through these projects as well for mountain bikers and hikers in the area. So why are we doing this? Um, you know, forests, like I said, restoring that forest economy is critically important for the Appalachian region. In Kentucky alone, there's about $9.1 billion in direct economic contribution of the forest through the timber industry, about 28,000 jobs in the forest industry, and um, when you include the secondary jobs as well, about 57,000 jobs out there. And um, the University of Kentucky um, did a study and they looked at opportunities and they uh, realized that if we were utilizing the forests properly and doing sustainable management and harvesting and things like that, it could create another 14,000 additional jobs and another $2.4 billion in value added annually. So it's a regenerative economy that we're trying to create here. And it also ties in with the just transition. Um, as the decline for Appalachian coal continues, um, you know, coal mining jobs in Kentucky are at their lowest levels in a century, in more than a century. So we're trying to create, you know, employment opportunities so that people want to stay in the region um, and take pride in the land that they're living in. So we're uh, doing this for a, a multitude of reasons. And why now? Um, you know, 
there's no reason not to do this work here. Um, the Appalachian region historically has had higher unemployment rates, higher poverty rates, greater income inequality rates than the nation as an average. So it's, you know, really the perfect program for the perfect area. And we intend to continue doing this work. You know, we've got, um, like I said, about a million acres out there. And, you know, I see us just increasing this as our brand recognition grows and as, as our, our name grows out there because we're still a young nonprofit organization. And I just wanted to end with this quote from Wangari Mathai. Um, the act of planting a tree reconnects the human spirit to the beauty and importance of the natural world, the basis for all life on earth. So I'll end there. That was a great presentation, Michael. Thank you very much. Um, okay. uh, really, uh, really cool program. And um, um, I, it looked like a lot of fun for those volunteers and for those workers to be out there too. And a great way to, great way to give back like your, like the quotation at the end of your presentation said. Um, uh, two quick things. One, uh, we're trying to reconnect with Chaz. So um, with any luck, we'll be able to um, give him some time um, after our next set of panelists uh, for him to, to sort of offer um, some additional remarks. Uh, we'll, we're doing our best to get back in touch with him. Second, uh, a reminder about questions. Uh, if you have questions uh, and you would like to ask them of our panelists, uh, the best way to do that is by following ESI on Twitter at ESI online and asking us that way. You can also send us an email and the email address to use is EESI at ESI.org and uh, we're getting questions in. So thank you very much for those who are, um, who are offering them. And when we, when we, uh, after we hear from our next two panelists, we'll, we'll dig into those questions right away. Um, speaking of our next two panelists, I'm going to introduce them together because they're going to be uh, tag teaming their presentation. Uh, our first uh, of the two is Tanya Gale. She is the Chief Development Officer at Green City Force, where she oversees fundraising and external communications. She is a board member of the Core Network, which focuses on national service, and Environmental Advocates of New York, which focuses on environmental justice. Tanya has spent her career in the human services sector, working in nonprofit organizations, largely focused on economic justice for young people of color. She is a graduate of Wesleyan University, she is a native Brooklynite, and she's passionate about pro uh, providing young people with viable paths to create and lead a just and equitable world. And her, uh, her co-presenter uh, on this presentation is Joshua Owens. Joshua is the project manager of the social enterprise at Green City Force, where he manages special projects involving uh, Green City Force alumni. Um, I like the way he uh, uh, began with his organization. He brings a unique skill set to the team and he's passionate about mentoring young adults. He was introduced to Green City Force in late 2014 by a relative uh, who was also an alumnus of Cohort 9. And uh, when you find a good organization, sometimes you just stick around and he's been part of the team ever since. And uh, so that's Joshua's story. Tanya, I'll turn it over to you and to Josh and uh, really look forward to your presentations. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great, thank you for having us today. Um, we're very excited to uh, join you. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Um, so yeah, Josh and I will be uh, presenting together and let's see, let's make sure I can get to the next, there we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're really happy to talk to you today about uh, Green City Force uh, uh, National Program as you've already done introduction. So I just will move on to the, the content here. Um, so Green City Force, we are, um, a nonprofit based in New York City. And we're really about uh, bringing young people who come from uh, New York City public housing communities into uh, the green economy through national service. Our, our core members are driving a sustainability uh, transformation within the public housing communities that they come from. And so as young adults, they are leaders in building a transformation through sustainability initiatives in their um, low income communities across New York. Um, it's a focus on uh, black and brown leadership uh, within um, 
the public housing sector where they are actually building skills and um, resources and workforce training that allows them to be frontline competitive candidates for um, career tracks within the sector beyond their service term and they're coming to us without any previous experience or exposure to that type of work so it's a transformative model that includes growth and opportunity for the individuals as well as um, the communities they come from. Uh, this is a shot of one of our cohorts uh, in New York a couple years back. Uh, we are New York City's basically green core and we uh, do sustainability initiatives within the public housing sector as well as aligned with New York City and um, the New York City public housing community uh, sustainability priorities. So our service initiatives and our priorities are based all within uh, the green economy and will vary in different activities and areas, largely tied to energy, energy efficiency, uh, depending on the moment in time and needs of the city and the community. And we build the skill sets and the training platforms and the um, service platforms for the young people um, depending on what the current need is in that moment in time. Um, as I said, uh, we focus on the, so NYCHA is New York City Housing Authority. That's the acronym that represents the population and communities we serve. Within that group, there are approximately 50,000 people within the age of 18 to 24 out of an overall community that Josh will speak to shortly of, um, one in 15 New Yorkers within that group, 72% of those young people prior to COVID were unemployed and had no viable platforms for um, next step employment or sustainable careers or family supporting economic opportunities. At the same time within New York City, the Housing Authority uh, represents a gigantic um, carbon footprint within the city. There are New York City uh, action and climate goals that are um, coming with lots of investments tied to energy efficiency, workforce opportunities. And so Green City Forest is um, connecting the dots between that unemployment need within the young people and the need and call to action to build a pipeline of resources and talent to address these climate issues that are existing within New York City. I'm going to have hand it on to Josh now. He's going to talk a little bit more specifically about uh, NYCHA and who we work with. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, so here's a photo of uh, Select NYCHA developments. Uh, over the years, NYCHA has been super important in, uh, to GCF being one of our biggest partners. We have uh, completed countless amount of work across the years within NYCHA, ranging from work from uh, energy efficiency from a project we created called Love You Live to uh, educate residents on ways to live more sustainable by reducing their water usage, reducing their energy usage, and all around just thinking different to uh, help lower their, their carbon footprint. Uh, so NYCHA is massive within scale, just to uh, shed some light to it. It spreads across five, uh, it spreads across all five boroughs. Uh, there's 326 NYCHA development, NYCHA developments. It houses over 500,000 500, tenants and it's the biggest housing developer within the country. So uh, it's huge and it's been important to us. We look to recruit all of our youth, all of our young adults for our program directly from NYCHA. So that's a key factor. Uh, we look to recruit youth between the ages of 18 through 24. Uh, and just give them the skills that they need to be successful. Uh, so they come in, they work with us, they come back and uh, it's creative because they're, they're giving back to their community, uh, the communities that they come from, from doing the work that's super important to not only us, uh, but our planet, right? Just to uh, sustain it. So it's been great, uh, but we're not done. <laughs> it's true. Thanks, Josh. And so to Josh's point, NYCHA is a city within a city. Uh, 500,000 people is uh, larger than uh, Atlanta um, or Boston. And so uh, again, this focus of community members we mentioned, you see the age range there, they're engaged with us full time through AmeriCorps, uh, ranging in a six to eight month time um, of service. And they're really having impactful skills building opportunities. And as we said, building their, um, their knowledge and leadership within uh, the environmental sector. 
and they're doing it from an urban lens and they're representing it as part of an urban core, um, New York City service core. And the model is built on the design of leading to employment opportunities. The whole purpose of the engagement is service is so that the young people can complete and be ready um, for competitive opportunities within employment, uh, sector specific, again, largely focused on energy, but there's a range which we'll speak to in a bit, as well as some innovative models tied to um, energy retrofits through our social enterprise. Uh, we have wraparound support services in our program so that the young people who are in, um, in service and beyond can have the support systems they need and resources um, whether that be fin uh, financial, social services, or otherwise. We have full-time social workers on staff, as well as career guides and coaching um, during and beyond the time that um, the members are in our program. This is an example overview of the different uh, sectors where our young people are placed post-service term. Uh, again, we'll get into more specifics of that going forward, but you can see energy efficiency, utilities, waste management, green infrastructure, uh, community health, because the young people in our program are themselves gaining skills and then returning to their communities and driving education and behavior change and educating others in their community about how they can change their uh, behavior tied to sustainability. It also builds a skill set that will sometimes lead to opportunities for employment um, as community health initiatives or outreach, um, outreach professionals as well. This slide is really um, an important one to focus on in terms of the idea of a proven approach, right? So there's a lot of conversation nationally and otherwise about the need for uh, Green Job Corps and opportunities. Uh, GCF is one of a number of conservation cores and a handful of urban conservation cores, which are a proven model. GCF has over 10 years had an average of 80% of our graduates who are unemployed or underemployed uh, coming to us with a high school uh, degree and no other career training or professional training. Um, and it's actually a higher now at 83% on average over the 10 years. We have over 500 graduates of our program. Uh, the past three years, our, our placement rate has actually been 96%, where the young people have within six months been able to be in jobs or schools following um, their service term. And so this is something that is an absolutely scalable and uh, necessary way to think about what the green economy could and should look like going forward. Um, we also, um, are continuing to like build partnerships and platforms to like obviously want to build more opportunities for young people to come into this type of model so that they can be successful and contribute as leaders going forward. Um, this is a, a snapshot of the member uh, journey, the core member journey. So on the far left, you'll see we recruit young people, as Josh said, from the public housing community across New York City. Uh, their only requirements are that they are a NYCHA resident and that they completed a high school credential and they're within the ages of 18 to 24. We bring them into service through recruitment and orientation in cohorts in groups. They work in teams collectively to learn together, to build leadership together, to inform how we should best approach engagement with their communities. And then on the third column, service and training, you see they're deployed into their own communities they're literally knocking on doors, they're building and managing um, farms and gardens, growing food, um, teaching others about composting, recycling, energy efficiency, uh, and they're also building 20% of their time professional skills and technical training so that they can then go into alumni hood in various sectors tied to sustainability um, for long-term impact and then becoming leaders beyond that as sort of leaders in uh, sustainability messaging and education beyond their time with us formally in service. This is a great shot. I love this shot of <laughs> Josh and his colleagues. I'll let him tell you a little bit about that experience now. Uh, yeah, so this was a picture that was taken back in, uh, I believe late 2014, uh, we were out in Far Rockaway, Queens, uh, scoping out an apartment, scoping out a home that we were looking to install solar panels on uh, within the next few days. So uh, we basically just got the lay of the land, what it takes to do the work, uh, obviously going over all the safety protocols and uh, 
and what it would look like once we actually got out there. Uh, it was a great day. As you can see, it's some smiles on some of our faces. My friend was pretty scared as you see him uh, <laughs> holding the edge, but all in all, the experience was great. Uh, for me, it was life changing. Uh, after that, I really, really wanted to be involved in what was going on here and just uh, trying to live a more sustainable life myself uh, so I could preach it the right way. Uh, so this was this was definitely a good day. Um, so some examples of our iconic uh, service initiatives. Again, we, we um, build service and priorities based on the needs of the time within the authority and the city. But broadly speaking, our iconic large scale initiatives have historically been farms at NYCHA where we have built and managed over six um, uh, urban farms on NYCHA property where we've grown over at this point, I believe over 100,000 pounds of uh, produce that is um, organic and free and accessible to the residents in exchange for uh, volunteer or composting time. It's a community driven model uh, tied to nutrition and then love where you live, which is our other iconic signature model of how we engage residents through what we call a credible messenger idea, young people coming from the communities being the drivers of the message of the need to change and build a more sustainable model within. Um, so those are the two broad um, signature um, programs. Here's just a quick overview of some of our major outcomes. Historically, you could see significant impact within reaching NYCHA residents, um, recycling, light bulb swapping um, from our farms. We've had studies tied to um, food policy and others where um, we've been able to evaluate the economic savings tied to food access for um, the residents from the communities of these low income NYCHA developments, as well as the reach for farm-based learning for young people, as well as community engagement through weekly farm stands and other initiatives here. Um, this is an overview of um, what we're calling as our, our next iteration of what our place-based models will look like. Our farms are being transformed into what we call eco-hubs, which really means we're trying to build in across our five sites within NYCHA layered levels of sustainability, whether that's solar, water, uh, rainwater catchment, um, ultimately moving towards a closed loop model where we're continuing to use the resources like our local and the community investment to build a longer term, um, uh, healthier, more sustainable, and also economically viable model, given again, the idea of this model happening from a low income community as a demonstration project that is scalable and replicable across other cities and other communities. Uh, here's some examples of some of our graduates, Salonia working in energy education, uh, Domingo, a leader in composting across New York City, who's now got his own um, business tied to that work. Um, we have strong employer partnerships where we have um, group hires at some point. So examples like Franklin Energy and energy auditing and I'll, I'll sometimes individual uh, placements, whether it be landscaping or individual hires for solar work or what have you. Um, again, just an overview of the sector. You can see a majority of our graduates are working in uh, energy building, roughly 65%. Um, and then we have an arm of our employment next step where we've created jobs. And I'll let John, um, sorry, Josh speak to our social enterprise work where we are building um, sector skills um, and uh, a longer term skill set opportunity for folks. Oh uh, yeah, definitely. So uh, our social enterprise was created to create a pipeline for a turn for returning alumni to uh, come and work with us on our current contracts that we we have uh, existing at, at that moment. So uh, two of our most dominant uh, scope of works has been uh, Empower New York, which is one contract we run uh, with in partnership with NYSERDA and Con Ed, where we get a uh, we're provided list of referrals to. Uh, go out to uh, people who's pre-qualified and uh, do energy audits within their home and uh, amongst other things. And then uh, one of our main contracts, which is uh, our EPC work, uh, the energy performance contract, which we work in relationship with NYCHA to help retrofit uh, NYCHA on a huge scale. Uh, it's the biggest retrofit project in the country. Uh, and basically we come in to educate residents like Tom, like Tanya mentioned before, uh, 
We come in to educate residents on sustainability. We make uh, three run-throughs of each unit to try uh, to successfully get into that unit to speak to the resident to speak to the resident and educate them on uh, ways to reduce their usage as well as swapping out inefficient lighting, aerators uh, and shower heads to try to reduce that water flow as well. Uh, we've been really, really successful at it. The uh, picture on the last side, it, it lists a demonstration of our team in full force at Ethan Ward Houses uh, in the Bronx. This is a circle up uh, probably around seven in the morning. We get started pretty early to uh, address what we call a, a two box talk, which is a safety meeting where we just basically do a quick run through of expectations for the day, uh, the team assignments and who would be paired together. We pair uh, two alumni together to go to these units for, for safety purposes and just to feed off each other to help one another. But uh, during these, during these uh, circle ups, we usually just get the lay of the way. Uh, and we address safety because it's our number one priority, keeping our young people safe in these uh, communities that we go in. Uh, so yeah, we've been pretty successful, just to end that before I get to this last side, we've been uh, pretty successful since 2017 when we first started on uh, our energy performance work. Uh, we made some mistakes, right? Uh, like everyone does, but we learn from it. and. Uh, I believe we're really, really good at it. To, to shed some light to it, we've been able to do 40,000 apartments, uh, over 40,000 units in the last three years. We've been able to swap uh, almost 200,000 bulbs, uh, just over a, a thousand aerators and a thousand shower heads. Uh, and we've pretty much been able to complete 90% of the units of developments we come to, to shed light to what that means. If we come to a development where there's a thousand uh, units, right? We've been able to get into 900 of those without these residents. Uh, they don't have to allow us to come in the apartment, right? It's not mandated. So it's just our guys going there to do the footwork, do the outreach and uh, just do it with passion. And we've been pretty successful at that. Our highest completion rate to date was a uh, 94% uh, completion at, uh, I forget the development, which sucks, but uh, we've been able to do it and we've been pretty successful at it. Moving on to this slide, uh, this is a great young guy uh, I worked with back in 2017. He worked with us on our energy performance contract and just to shed some light to one of his achievements here with us, he was able to move on to start a partnership program with Local 3, which is a, a hard union to get into, but uh, he was really, really dedicated about it. I worked with him personally, so I'm hoping he sees this today. Uh, he's an amazing young guy. Uh, he always asked a lot of questions. He was the type of guy to get there first, leave last. Uh, and even though he was great, he would come every morning and say, what could I do better? And we would tell him nothing. You're like killing it. You're, you're great. And this is just proof to his dedication and uh, I hope he's doing well. Shout out her time. Thanks, Josh. Um, so in terms of like next steps, I uh, just want to point out that the way our model works is the AmeriCorps program. We have federal investment through AmeriCorps, but at the state level in New York City, the Energy Authority has made a commitment to investing $70 million in clean energy workforce funding and they have prioritized populations including AmeriCorps and Conservation Corps. And so this is an example of what can be replicated in terms of policy input and commitments in other parts of the country. Um, uh, we talked a bit about the other sectors of uh, our alumni work. So I'll just go through these quickly. Horticulture, nutrition and food, zero waste. Um, so a third of the, of the uh, investment for the service members is through AmeriCorps National Investment. We're looking for city and state complementary investment, whether that's at the state level or city level. Um, we're looking for line items. We're looking for um, a way to have built in commitment to conservation cores and use to, in order to provide opportunities for more young people like our core members to have opportunity for growth. Uh, we also, um, you know, want to call for AmeriCorps to be more impactful and expansive about the ways that they support young people in service. That includes increased stipends for folks coming from these low income communities 
and the need to include investments around the support services that are necessary in order to make sure that they're successful. And then um, you can see a third also of our investment is from private resources. And a lot of our contract work, as Josh mentioned, an example of the largest um, energy retrofit in the country is the one currently underway within NYCHA, multi years of investment. More of that type of government and other um, commitments to investing in this work is key to our funding model. I just want to wrap up by saying, you know, we as GCF are part of a larger uh, core network of over 130 conservation cores doing really important work around bringing young people into leadership. These are some, some examples of the urban ones across the country, Austin, Philadelphia, California, and um, it really is um, an important model for us to think about in terms of scalability and investment specific to meeting the needs that fit this particular criteria particularly at this moment of an intersection of racial, economic, and environmental injustice. This is a solution that we think is real and necessary and needs to um, improve. So thank you. We appreciate uh, your time and I'm definitely happy to have some uh, answer some questions. Thank you for having us. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Josh. Josh, you, um, I enjoyed your presentation, but you kept saying you were pretty good, pretty successful, and I think maybe time to drop out the, uh, the, the pretty and maybe exchange it for very, very good, very successful. Um, looks like you guys are doing great stuff. And um, just in general, Michael, Tanya and Josh, congratulations on, um, on what your programs have been able to accomplish so far. And um, you know, it's, it's great to see the metrics and the light bulbs and, uh, and all of that stuff, but also the, the people that you've impacted um, in a positive way um, is, is, uh, is really meaningful. And, uh, exactly the kinds of stories we were hoping to get to our audience today. So thank you very much. Um, we are going to turn to questions now. Um, as a quick reminder, if you have questions, we've been getting them in. So thank you to our audience. If you have more questions or you have other questions, you can follow us on Twitter at EESI online. You can also send us an email, um, EESI at EESI.org. Um, and we're still trying to get in touch uh, with Chaz. I'm not sure it's going to work out um, for the next, you know, 17 or 18 minutes or so. So We'll put our heads together with him and try to figure out a new way to, to bring his story to, uh, to our audience, maybe using another medium or another approach. But um, um, obviously, we're, we're sad to have missed his uh, presentation today, and we'll be back in touch with him and um, following up. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Amber Todorov. Amber uh, is uh, the organizer of today's session um, and has done a ton of work over the entire course of Workforce Wednesdays. She's my co-moderator today, and she's going to kick off Q&A. Hi, thanks so much, you guys. This is a wonderful project uh, to hear about. So I guess my first question, which is kind of throwing it back to last week on um, engaging with high schoolers and green careers. Um, could you, do you guys um, work with high schools? And, and if so, how, how does that work? Well, I'll go first. Yeah, we work with a lot of high schools. Um, we bring them out um, from the local community. We work with high schoolers, middle schoolers, um, local colleges and universities. We bring them out. We teach them about, you know, the history of their area, the history of reforestation on surface mines. And then we teach them how to plant trees and how trees benefit them and their local community and everything. Um, and sometimes we have, you know, different projects where it might be a riparian restoration. They learn about water quality or the wildlife of the area, um, different things of that nature. So education, you know, we, we started this with basically two parts to our mission. It was environmental and economic. But then we realized that education was a huge part of it as well. So, yeah, we always try and involve student groups when we can. Yeah, for GCF, we actually don't don't work with high schools in any sort of traditional way, really. Um, we actually had a group of high school students come to us last year and uh, solicit interviews because they were doing a um, in-house sustainability competition, which was tied to funding, and they wanted to feature Green City Forest. So they came in to interview us to learn about our program. And this group of amazing high school freshmen basically pitched our program and were able to like raise a thousand dollars for us in support of our work. So they clearly were drawn by our work and, and sustainability. In terms of recruitment, because our graduate, I'm oh, sorry, because our members 
are required to ha either complete high school and many of our um, young adults have not been traditional high school students. We don't um, formally recruit through that process. Um, our largest partnership is really through two big groups. One, the Housing Authority itself, which has a whole arm of workforce and community engagement that works in partnership with us. And we're part of a public-private uh, partnership city initiative under the Mayor's Office of Criminal uh, Justice, where literally over 30 um, CBO partners, uh, city agencies, youth programs, community centers, um, wraparound groups within 15 neighborhoods with the highest uh, rates of violent crime in NYCHA work collectively to engage young people and bring them into our program. So um, they're not specific to high schools, but it's overlapping within that group, how we reach some high school students. Wow, that's so cool. Um, so you both mentioned um, all the great work that you've been doing. So how, how can you scale this work? What, what kind of federal support or local support or would you would you need to um, expand your operations? Well, I guess I'll go first. Yeah, just um, you know, increased awareness of this, you know, at the highest levels of government, you know, the importance of it, the benefits of it, things of that nature. Because there is some funding available through the Farm Bill, um, Reclaim, you know, the pilot AML pilot. There is some funding for reforestation, but it's just not enough, and sometimes. Um, private landowners especially don't like um, some of the, I guess, impediments to it. You know, there's a lot of paperwork sometimes involved, um, encumbrances on their properties, things of that nature. But we are seeing a lot more private investment in it as well. But yeah, to scale it up, it's just a matter of funding, whether it comes through private, you know, capital or through federal investment. Um, yeah, we've, you know, got proof of concept. It's just a matter of you know, finding ways to drive funding to this and kind of streamline everything. Sure, um, at the federal level, um, I would say conservation corps need to have dedicated line of commitment, um, whether that's like comparable to like Youth Build, for example, has, has a line in, in HUD and others. We have uh, AmeriCorps opportunities. There's, there's talk within Congress around expanding that, but like to really be thoughtful about what that means on the ground in terms of the actual needs of the participants means like beyond a stipend, which is necessary, uh, being mindful that to really reach the broad range of people, um, you know, uh, basically afflicted by the, the issue of unemployment right now, like pre and certainly post COVID to be very comprehensive in what those resources mean, whether that means increased stipends, whether that means wrap around, funding for wraparound supports, like an expansion of the way AmeriCorps funding is, is uh, deployed. And then absolutely some dedicated lines that are specific to these populations at the state level, similar to the example we gave through NYSERDA at the state level, you know, committing priority population funding opportunities, particularly now, is really critical. Um, and then more than anything, you know, obviously consistent, sustained, multi-year anchor investment that doesn't depend on like a one-off year-to-year um, effect is really critical um, to have capacity building across the conservation cores um, nationally, and, and as well as an understanding of what urban cores in particular would need to be successful and, and, and understand those discrepancies and differences is really important. Uh, I'm gonna ask a question that's come in from our audience and it actually kind of a good segue, it's about funding um, and sort of the, how your programs uh, operate. Um, uh, um, it's the, the basic question is sort of where do your programs get funding? You've answered it in different ways. And so, Michael, I'm, I'm interested if you could um, I'd love to hear your response, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about maybe how your, uh, your pie chart looks. Uh, Tanya had said, you know, state, local, federal, private sources. I would love to learn a little bit more about how your work is funded. And then Tanya and Josh, um, you mentioned the fee for service, um, the performance contract that you're working on. What are the other kinds of fee for service options that you think you might have, that your program might have at its disposal that you're, or that you're exploring? Um, but Michael, maybe we'll start with you um, to maybe uh, understand a little bit more about sort of all the different funding sources that come together to let you do your work. 
Okay, yeah, our funding sources, it's fairly well balanced, our pie chart, you know, it's probably about a third government um, contracts, government grants, um, one third foundational support, you know, we've got a lot of partnering organizations, the Arbor Day Foundation, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, others, um, and then about a third um, just general donations from individuals, you know, philanthropists who are interested in this work. And, um, you know, for the federal side, we've always got to have that one-to-one -one match, whether it's a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Forest Service or somebody like that. So that's where the foundations and the private investment really comes in. We've got corporate sponsors like Komatsu, who is a manufacturer of um, construction and mining equipment. They've been a big supporter of ours over the years. So um, it's kind of a mix of public, private, and foundations that support us. And then we pair everything together and scale up our projects as large as we can. Um, Josh, you want to start a little bit about Empower and some of the other current social enterprise, and then I can speak to some of the other things that we are thinking about? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so our, our primary uh, two projects, like I mentioned before, is uh, Empower New York and uh, our work on the energy performance contract. Just recently, we did uh, complete work on the census. We worked with the census to spread awareness on why that's so important and uh, trying to get people to really, really understand so they could uh, they could fill out this census because it's important to, to our countries, to our states for funding to, to supply uh, people that need it the most and for the repairs and things of that nature that we need. Uh, but we're, we're looking to work on other things, uh, obviously, uh, long term in the future. But our main two projects has been uh, the two I mentioned. I could probably shed a little bit more light to our work on Empower, uh, which is similar to the work done within public housing uh, on our EPC contract. So we basically, we, we get referrals from uh, NACERTA to uh, do some outreach, and then we try to come out and uh, do some energy assessments within uh, the residence home. The teams are usually paired up in twos, uh, as I mentioned before, for safety purposes uh, and just to feed off of each other. So during those audits, our teams would uh, come in, they would they would test the stoves to see if it's incomplete combustion. Uh, so they're testing for gas leaks, they're testing for, for CO2. If the residents don't have a uh, uh, CO2 detectors or smoke uh, or fire alarms. We install combo alarms. We uh, we take out their shower heads to try to uh, make it more efficient if their shower heads are using a higher GPM, gallons of water per minute. Uh, we, we try to lower that. Uh, we need a refrigerator to see if it's working uh, efficiently and if it's not, we put in a recommendation for uh, that to be replaced. We've been doing that work for years and our alumni has been, they've been driving the train. Uh, they've been really, really good at it. And uh, we've been good partners with, with NYSERDA since because of the work they've done. But uh, all in all, the, the work we do, those are our main uh, two projects as of now. We're always excited to do more things, but we're, we're looking at other opportunities now. Yeah. And I would say that across the Conservation Corps community, there are other cores um, that have a lot more contract work for their service uh, initiatives than we do. Uh, we started originally with the Cool Roots Initiative with the New York City um, government uh, when we first started, and that was contract uh, work to um, uh, coat, coat roofs white. Um, there are two, basically two arms of how we look to get additional fee for service. The majority of our um, AmeriCorps service track is with traditional funding and not so much innovative, but ideally we would love contracts that don't conflict with AmeriCorps policy. Basically, long story short, if we can get government contracts that are for fee for service, we could use those resources to support our service core. And if they're private or for profit companies that are having contract work, like in the energy efficiency, we would deploy that as a way for our, um, our graduates within the social enterprise to be able to get um, increased investment. So um, we're definitely um, eager and looking at more of that. And again, some of our other uh, partner cores around the country are doing more of that contract work tied to city priorities, right? So in whatever initiatives that need to be addressed, whether it's, you know, local local sustainability um, initiatives that come with contracts, we would love to have more of that. 
Um, basically looking to tie the city investments into direct support of these cores that can be the pipeline for frontline communities driving those changes and then getting the employment opportunities they need is, is what is really critical. So here's another question from our audience. Um, what are your views on the efforts to establish a government funded or operated civilian conservation corps um, like had existed um, in the depression? Um, any thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, I th well, again, the, the core network is represents 130 uh, conservation corps across the country. Within that, as I said, uh, a handful of urban cores. So we feel there are examples and models currently of what that is, whether you call it that or don't call it that, but to recognize that this work is ongoing and that the um, the input and the need for these cores to be at the table in messaging this work and what can uh, help it to scale even further is really critical. So I guess my, my short answer is, I feel like you know tapping into what is existing currently in this work is the best and you know efficient and proactive way to maximize what potential is out there and needed in the short term. I'll second that. Yeah, it already exists, and you know why should they reinvent the wheel? A lot of times, it's just a matter of scaling what is already being done on the ground. Great. Uh, we have, we have lots of questions. Uh, probably more questions today from our audience from the last couple of briefings that we've had. So this is great. Lots of interest in this topic, um, and this one's about um, metrics. Um, one the the question is. Um, Sort of how do you go about estimating uh, the impacts that you're having on your communities? Um, is that something that you do, your groups do individually? Do you use local partners, perhaps university partners? Um, and, you know, that I, the, the question extends to, you know, emissions reductions potential, secondary economic benefits. How do you, how do you make your case with metrics? My, my, maybe we'll start with you again, Michael. Yeah, well, sometimes our work is tied in with research and things of that nature, but we track a lot of data for all of our projects, whether it's dollars invested or um, number of trees planted, survival rates over time, things of that nature, volunteers, volunteer hours, volunteers under the age of 25 years old, so we can, you know, track our youth involvement, things of that nature, and then um, you know, we're still working out some of the models about carbon accumulation rates and things like that, but those can be tied in as well. And we're currently working on some proposals to look at um, at-risk species benefits of it. You know, amphibians, bats, um, some of the other species that aren't tracked. So we work a lot of times, you know, we'll have master's students at West Virginia University or University of Kentucky or elsewhere um, working on, you know, their projects with us, you know, what questions do we need answered and things of that nature. But yeah, we track a lot of data for all of our projects. Number of jobs created. So. Uh, Josh, I'll let, let you start by talking about like, what do, what, what, like when you were in service and through uh, social enterprise, what are the examples of the data that you all track? And then I can sort of add on to that, the macro other parts and how we work with partners metrics oh yeah definitely so uh, on our social enterprise uh, data is extremely important uh, to all of us here right to track the numbers and know the production the work we do uh, on our contracts is production based right to generate revenue so uh, we we hold our hat to that and uh, the system we basically have created and set up just to explain what we do uh, for our EPC work we come to a particular development we're assigned uh, whatever it may be, NYCHA uh, and whoever the subcontractor is. That time we, we worked in the past with Armoresco and Constellation. They would assign us 13 uh, developments, say, for that year. And uh, we would probably spend two months per site uh, working through and trying to do the community-based outreach, trying to get a, just trying to get into as many apartments as we can. <clears throat> Our teams, they move in pairs of two. Uh, so it's usually one person doing the work in the installs and uh, speaking to the resident while uh, the other one is helping 
if they if they can in uh tracking what's going on. Uh what are we doing? What are we swapping out? What what was that wattage based off this wattage? Uh they do that on paper copies and then from there they come back to our office space. So usually when we come to development, it's uh it's a pre-start meeting that I, I usually attend and we figure out a, a office space with that development. And uh, we have a full, full we have a, a full system set up at every site we go to. So we bring printers, we have laptops, radios for safety, uh, scanners, and basically, and we have a data team. So we, we have a data team on site. So while the teams are doing the installs, they uh, complete the work, they come back to do uh, refills, they swap out uh, the waste, the uh, disposable lights, the disposable aerators, shower heads, whatever it may be. And then they pass that paperwork directly off to the data team. It's usually two people to work in coexistence with each other to, to, to make sure it's correct, right? We don't want one eye on it. So that data is entered in live. Uh, we track it consistently day by day. And then at the end of the day, that data, it's QC is checked, it's processed, we're going over mistakes, if it's things that's wrong. We're addressing those mistakes directly with the person that made it. So we, it's just no shame in it, right? But we just want to address it and make sure it doesn't happen going, uh, going, uh, going on. So we scan documents at the end of the day, and then they're backed up into digital folders to keep forever. Uh, and we'll always have that information. And then we just cross-reference that against our line by lines, which would be a spreadsheet of what the production is throughout the development. So that's how I track it and we do it on our side. And so from the service perspective, it's similar that we're using data collection as actually part of the training experience as well, not only at the graduate level, but in the service level. So as Josh mentioned, examples of how we track service outcome data. We also track metrics tied to our um, farm and place-based outcomes, pounds of food grown, resident engagement. You saw some of those stats in our slides and we absolutely track um, the outcomes of our participants, so graduation rates, uh, um, employment, salaries, wages, et cetera, because as a workforce program, that's a priority for us. And then our partnerships vary um, through the city, through NYCHA, um, and we have spent the past four years working with the CUNY Food Policy Institute on a three-year evaluation study looking to take um, in um, community impacts that align above and beyond our GCF outcomes. And so some of the nutrition and cost savings for food and et cetera. Uh, ideally, you know, we for a long time have been wanting to like work towards a pay for success model. Um, NYCHA as our major partner, you know, oversees obviously a lot of the content of um, metric outcomes. And so our vision, our future vision would be absolutely to have a more robust way to be innovative in our funding and pay for sex, for sex models tied to metrics. That's great. Um, that's um, really, really interesting stuff. Um, uh, the world of nonprofits, right? It's, uh, funding and metrics. Those are uh, pretty much what it all boils down to. Um, well, this was wonderful. Um, a, a great panel. Um, Chaz, if you're streaming, if you're watching this right now, sorry, we uh, we're deprived of half of your presentation. We'll do our best to get back in touch with you to help you tell your story about everything you're doing out in Albuquerque. Um, but uh, to Michael and to Tanya and to Josh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, excellent presentations. And um, I said it before, I'll say it again. Congratulations on all your good work to date and good luck uh, going forward. You guys are doing really important stuff. And we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy days to join us. Uh, let me also uh, sh uh, thank Amber uh, and uh, our policy team uh, that it also includes Ellen and Anna, our communications team that includes uh, Omri and Sydney and Dan O'Brien, who's been helping us uh, out behind the scenes with all these briefings. Uh, let me also say thanks to our four uh, fall interns, uh, Emma, Karen, Hamilton, and Joseph. Um, they've been helping with questions and with social media and all that good stuff. And we couldn't do anything that we do without our, uh, our cadre of interns. Um, there's a slide up right now. Um, this is a survey. If you have a few moments, we'd uh, really enjoy uh, reading your feedback. Uh, we take it all very seriously and we're always looking to improve. If you missed anything from today, uh, you can visit us online, www.esi.org. Everything, uh, all the slides and, and, a, and an archived webcast will be available. Uh, and we also have permission from Chaz to post his slides uh, as well. Uh, his, his remarks as well. So if you if you missed anything, never fear. It's all online. You just have to visit us there and, and you can access it. 
Uh, one last thing, a quick reminder, uh, actually two last things, a quick reminder. Uh, we have three more Workforce Wednesdays. Uh, we have next Wednesday, Energy Transition in Coal Country, followed by Growing Green Industry and Innovation, Mass Timber, and Low Carbon, Small Business and Post-COVID Recovery. And also keep an eye out for um, our bonus briefing um, that should be announced uh, this week. And uh, the best way, one last time, to stay uh, up to date with all things EESI is to sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. We're a couple minutes over. Uh, apologies for that. But thanks again to our panelists for joining us. And thanks to those in our audience for joining us today to learn about a new spin on Conservation Corps. Hope everyone has a great rest of your Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye.